that I really like, and I'm going to challenge you on this one, well probably not because you're coaches, but um, some of you may find this challenging, is I often hear my clients say, she makes me feel like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know that one. Now, can anybody make us feel a certain way? No. no. Sorted. <laughs> now, there's, for those of you who struggle with this, uh, I have a client who, and we were talking about shadows before, she's overweight, she comes to see me because she's overweight. Um, her mom is overweight and her mom sent her to me, which is interesting that her mom didn't come to see me, she sent her daughter. <laughs> now, last week we were, we were having a chat about this and she told me that her mom is obsessed with her. Her mom is watching everything she eats. And so this client, she had food intolerance tested and she's intolerant to gluten, dairy, eggs and sugar. So she managed to find some food that she can eat, some little gluten-free, sugar-free, egg-free, name it free <coughs> tablets. And when she brought those tablets home, her mom went mental, absolutely mental. And she, she yelled at her, she took the tablets, stomped on them, threw them in the bin. Now, talking about shadows, remember the shadows? Those are the parts of us that we really don't like about ourselves. What do you think might be going on for the mum on this one? Yes, Rachel? She sounds like she's getting the counselling vicariously through her daughter. So if her daughter slips up, then it's a slip up for her. Exactly. So what's interesting is the mum, they, they're both doing Slimming World. So the mum has registered both of them in Slimming World. And the mum is obsessed with her daughter eating the right food that fits with Slimming World. But what actually is going on there is the mum is not doing it herself. She doesn't, she sends her daughter to therapy, but she doesn't go to therapy. And then she gets upset when the daughter doesn't follow the rules. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's a way that we project our shadows, uh, for example. Now, Coming back to this client, she told me, my mum, my mom, when she does this, she makes me feel worthless. And of course I challenged her, I said, can anyone make you feel somewhere, or somehow? And she said, yes, she does make me feel worthless. And actually what's interesting here and what's important is to recognize that it's not the mum that makes her feel worthless, because the mum doesn't have a remote control with the, the worthless button going like, ding, it doesn't work like this. The mum says or does something, and it's actually not the mum's behavior, it's the meaning that my client is uh, assigning to that behavior <coughs> that creates the worthless feeling. Because my client, she says that when her mum does this, it must be because she's not good enough to do it herself, that she doesn't have the self-discipline, that she doesn't have the motivation to do it herself. That means, that meaning is what makes her feel worthless, not what the mom says. Because someone else, having a mom behaving like this, could respond completely differently. They could become angry, they could rebel. So it's not the mom, it's the meaning that we assign to her behavior. Again, it's the story that we're making. Does that make sense? The nodding. <laughs> Recognize situations there? <laughs> Um, in the same way, people can't make us do something or feel something, but we can't, in going back to relationships, we can't make our partners do what we want them to do. It's hard, I know. But we can't. What we can do is create motivations <coughs> and opportunities. But at the end of the day, people do what they want to do. So those are just a few ways that I've come across and have experience um, with my clients on how we project ourselves in the external world and in our relationships. Are there any other ways that you can think of, that you came across? Oh. How many of those ones sound familiar to you, you've experienced before, you've you know people who your clients who experienced it themselves. 
Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So how does that feel when you're on the other side? When you're being projected upon? Now that you know what it means to project ourselves, and as you've noticed, we do that a lot, very often, <coughs> and most of us do it, actually, because, again, you know, we, we haven't been educated on this. Now that you know how it works, how does it feel when you're on the other side? So what's your experience of this? When someone is projecting onto you, how did you know someone is projecting onto you? So yes, there are, there are different ways. It's important to learn, because if you want to improve your communication and relationships, you need to observe when you're being projecting, but also when the other person is projecting. So another reaction to, to a situation, or as Tracy said, something illogical, is a sign that something is going on. I did it myself. I do it quite a lot, actually. Um, where, for example, uh, back a few years ago, I was very stressed because of work. And I had a lot of responsibilities, and I had a lot of things happening at the same time. And I found myself starting to snap at my partner for anything. Absolutely anything. So whether he would wear a pink jumper instead of a blue one, bam, I would snap. Or the dishes, or name it, I would snap. And I didn't know this at the time. I didn't know what was going on for me. I genuinely believe, because that's the problem, isn't it? We genuinely believe we're upset about that specific thing. But in hindsight, what I recognized was actually I was very stressed with what was going on around me. I felt under pressure. I felt out of my comfort zone. And all those insecurities and fears that came up for me, I projected them onto my partner and I snapped. So no reaction or illogical reaction is a sure sign that something else is running. Um, now there's also physical sensation. So kinesthetic sensation is a good one. Um, when, I'm going to use another predicate here, when something doesn't resonate with you, so you, your partner attacks you on something, criticize you on something, and you go, I have no idea what you're talking about. Genuinely, even when you look inside, you can't relate to that. Have you experienced this? Mm -hmm. So I had this a few years ago with one of my best friends, we fell out. Um, it was quite, from my perspective, quite a ridiculous situation. We were invited to a birthday, and he was there with his girlfriend. I arrived at the same time as a very good girlfriend of mine. And when we walked through the door, he looked at us, he and his girlfriend looked at us, and lost it completely, accusing me of having brought that friend on purpose to the birthday party to try to destroy his relationship, his current relationship with his girlfriend. Now, that didn't resonate at all, because I didn't understand, I felt completely taken aback because nothing related to what I was feeling. Number one, I didn't bring the friend, she came as well, she was invited. And number two, I was, why would I want to do this? You're my best friend, why would I want to destroy your relationship? So when you have those kind of experience where you go like, where did that come from? Even when I scan myself inside out, I can't find a trace of truth in it. Now, of course, there was a projection in here, it's not even him that was projecting on me, it was her projecting on him, projecting on me. <laughs> Quite complex. Thank God they're not together anymore. <laughs> <laughs> of course it works. <clears throat> but that's that's a sign when something doesn't resonate. Yeah, when something is you, you can't relate to this. Another good uh, sign is when so say a friend or your partner keeps criticizing you about something, or keep bringing up something, or attacking you on something. And it may resonate, it may not, but say if it resonates, you also notice that when they talk about other people, they bring up the same thing. So they criticize the same trait in other people as well. That is often the sign that actually there's something running for them, and they see that in a lot of different people, you're just part of it. That's again a sign that you're being projected upon. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Person would you become for yourself, but also in relation to your relationships, um, if you were not projecting, if you were what I call your realized self, how might you be different? More relaxed. 
relapsed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it takes a lot of bravery to move on from your projected self. It does. So you become more more brave, more authentic, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a big step. Yes. I think you can you can understand a lot about projecting. <coughs> Absolutely. Actually, to actually say to that person you're projecting on this stop mm. is a massive step that you know, I certainly. But and when you're able message. to do it, how different will you be as a person and in your relationships? I think I could use a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell you, by the way. <laughs> you lose all your friends. <laughs> so you make new ones. You make new ones. Yeah. It's very true. It's very true. So you become more grounded, more present, because you're not the slave of your past anymore. You become someone who's able to... You're in control of your past. Or you're in control of your patterns and even though you might not solve them all you're actually instead of being blind and being controlled by them you control them mm -hmm. so you become more grounded you become more mature as well you communicate much better you're much more you're calmer as well because you stop making all those crazy stories in your mind and you're much <laughs> more able because they're tiring um, you're much more able to be in the present, to be grounded, and therefore to, to communicate in a much deeper and much better level with other people. And how is that affecting your relationship? What kind of relationship comes out of two people who are two realized self or on their way? Yeah, that becomes a real deep meaningful relationship, doesn't it? Where you experience emotional intimacy and where you can actually connect at the deepest level with someone. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what's the journey? How do you do this? So on a personal <laughs> level, the first step is to start to become aware of when you're projecting out of everything we discussed tonight. Notice your stories, notice what you tell yourself, notice all those distorted thinking that you're having that makes, uh, makes you be the, the victim of your own patterns. Start to spot your patterns. So that's something you can do yourself. What you can also do, you can, and I strongly suggest you do this, get to know yourself in depth. Because if you don't know yourself, how can you enter a relationship and learn to know someone else if you're not even aware of what's going on in there? So start to explore what, what are your shadows? What are your buttons? What are the wounds from your childhood you haven't sorted? What's still hurting? What are your values? What are your beliefs? Your model of relationship? Everything you absorbed as a kid? What's all this? What's your level of codependency? And I'm saying your level because 98% of people suffer from some level of codependency. So there's perhaps two people in this room are free from it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what's, how, how are your patterns of codependency? It's not something that's... Not everyone has got the same patterns, unfortunately. It's a very complex thing, but we, we, most of us, we have it. So what's yours? Start to explore this, and you can do this with a coach or a therapist or with, with some friends, but it's, it's really worth it to start to explore who you are, to understand what's going on for you. And also take responsibility. Because at the end of the day, that's what I call the 50-50 rule. It's basically in any given situation, any conflict, any challenge between two people, it's not always the other person's fault. We tend to blame, we tend to go, you did that, but actually <coughs> it's not true. I call it the 50-50, it's not 50-50, uh, but we all have our share of responsibility. You start to own your share of responsibility, start to ask yourself whenever you, you're in a, a conflict with someone, a challenge with someone, what's my part in it? What, what's running for me? Before you accuse the other person, which is much easier, <laughs> I'm with you on that, <laughs> ask yourself, what's, what's going on for me? And it's not either all your fault, it's 50-50. So what about... How do you do this in a relationship? So how do you go from projected self to realized self in a relationship? So the first step is obviously to work on yourself. So two people need to do that work individually before coming together for the best chance of relationship. Once you're there, once you've started to do this work on yourself, it's a very efficient way to do this is to actually share your story with your partner. If you're in a meaningful relationship with someone you can trust, of course, don't do that if you don't trust that person. 
then share your story, explain what's, what you discovered I mean, in terms of your buttons, your shadows, your codependency, everything. Share that with that person because that's the opportunity for both of you to work as a team and to help each other and to go like, oh look, that's your button, that's your shadow, that's your pattern. Instead of being caught up into the, the actual issue, which most of the time has got nothing to do with what's presented, you can help each other to identify your blind spots because we do have blind spots. So that's a good way to do this, <coughs> to work together, and also it creates a deeper connection, a deeper bond. Now, often in relationships, when you come into a relationship, a meaningful relationship, because relationships, they are the place you're going to experience emotional intimacy. That's the place you're going to be vulnerable, probably the most vulnerable. That's the, probably the, one of the only places you're going to be seen and known as never before. Guess what it does? It triggers all your fears, insecurities, all the unresolved stuff from the past, poof, comes up at the surface. So, as on your personal life, but also as a coach or a therapist, it's very important to be aware of when people do that journey into their relationship, they often reach at some point a kind of breakthrough point where the patterns come up and then this, that creates a crisis, especially, so either it's one of the partner or the two at the same time or in, in similar times, that will create a crisis because how do people respond when their fears and insecurities come up? Some people are okay with it, but some people spend their life avoiding it, either by running away from relationship, by avoiding relationships or finding uh, the wrong partners, emotionally unavailable partners. So those people, when they actually experience this for the first time, they're very likely to become very overwhelmed. Because suddenly, they're out of their comfort zone, they're experiencing feelings they've been trying to avoid all their lives. Now, it's important to, as a coach or a therapist, to remind them this is normal when it happens. Even if it creates a crisis in the relationship, it's a normal point. It's actually a, a turning point, because that's the opportunity that they have to tackle those bloody patterns that have been there all their lives and they can actually change them. Now guess what happens at the neurological level, thinking of brain um, neuroplasticity? What happens if they start, in, instead of doing their usual pattern of running away or hiding, they face the patterns in that healing place, what happens in the brain? It creates new connections, and then you practice this new connection, and it becomes the habit. It becomes the new default. And someone very wise told me one day that there are patterns and there are wounds that you can only heal in relationships. And it's true. I rejected that for a long time, but it's true. Actually, there are some things that only come up in relationships. Now, if you don't stop them then, if you run away, if you try to avoid them, <coughs> what's going to happen? So either you run away from relationships altogether, you never have a relationship ever again, very unrealistic, because one day you fall into the trap again, and then it will happen again. <laughs> or, you actually decide to face it, and that's your opportunity to sort out those patterns, to free yourself from all this, and actually experience deep intimacy, and the, the deepest connection there is with someone. It's worth it, isn't it? So that's a journey you can take on a personal level and in relationships. Now, let me briefly give you tools. I only have 10 minutes left, so I have to be very quick. Um, a few things that you can do to start going from projected self to realize self. The first thing is awareness. So the little exercise that I uh, asked you to do before, that's the starting point. You need to become aware of what are your cues that you're projecting. So if you've done TA, look for the child ego state, because that's very likely a state you're in when you're projecting. So start to identify your cues. Once you've identified your cues, take a deep breath, stop, take a step back, and break state. Do something else. Don't engage in the conversation when you're in that state, because it's likely to go downhill. So break state until you recover from it, until you're in a much better place to have a conversation. And then when you're in that state, ask yourself, every time you have another reaction, so all those cues we talked about before, how do you know when you're projecting or when someone is projecting on you, when you have another reaction, when 
you have a very strong emotional reaction. Ask yourself, what situation did I experience in the past that's similar? What does that person remind me of in the past? What, when did I experience those kind of feelings before? Try to find, if a button has been pushed, try to find the situations or the person in your past that's pushing your button. Because you're responding to your past, you're not responding to the present. I've got a client who we've been working on our codependency for a long time, and we've learned to uh, develop those strategies. Every time she recognizes that she slips into projection, and for her, the cue is she knows she steps into the child <coughs> state. So she's noticed physical cues or emotions that are associated with a child ego state. Every time she does this, she takes a step back, she tells her boyfriend, look, I need to take some time to think about all this. And then, so she takes some time to identify the situation. She comes back and she tells her boyfriend, okay, look, that's what's going on for me. So she, she takes her share of responsibility. Share with your partner your share of responsibility. And she says, okay, now when you said that, and always I statements, not you did this, but when that situation happens, when you said that, I felt like this. Just start with stating what's true for you, stating how you feel. Not necessarily trying to give a judgment on how you feel or create an explanation, but just go, that's how I feel. That was a trigger, that's how I feel. And if you, you practice that a lot, go, and that's the button that <coughs> Because if you communicate like this with your partner when there's a, a challenging situation, so just imagine the difference if, I, I take back the first example of the wife coming home and dinner is not ready. If the wife goes, you bloody <laughs> thing. <laughs> You don't love me. You should have made dinner. It's always the same. Imagine the reaction with the husband. On another hand, if the wife comes home, she's tired, and she goes after taking a break and identifying what's going on for her. When I came home and I saw you didn't make dinner, what I felt was I felt let down. But I recognize that in my past, there's been those situations I felt let down before, and I recognize the button has been pushed. Which one is the most likely to give a positive outcome? Okay, so it's, it's quite important to always use I statement and state what's true for you. Now there's another thing that's very, very important to do is, remember when I was talking about creating our stories and mind readings, gather facts and evidences. I can't stress that enough. When you start to make a story in your mind, stop and go like, is that story true? So I have a client, she's absolutely incredible, she's 73, and she comes to see me. Um, because she broke up with her boyfriend a year and a half ago, they've been together 38 years, and she comes to see me because she doesn't manage to move on. So she wants me to hypnotize her, and then make him disappear. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, I started to explore with her what was going on in there, and I discovered, I was horrified to discover, when I said, what happened in the breakup? One day, she was home, he texted her, and the text said, I really love you, I want you in my life forever. He came home, she opened the door with a phone like this and said, who was that text for? <gasps> <laughs> Very aggressive, attacking him. He responded, he reacted by going, I didn't send that. She said, that's your number, you're lying to me. Give me your keys and get out of there. They broke up. That was a year and a half ago. And I said to her, so what evidences do you have <clears throat> that this text wasn't for you? And guess what? She doesn't have any. And you should see her face the day I said that to her. When I said to her, how can you be sure that text wasn't for you? She said, but he doesn't do this. He's never told me this. I said, what other explanation could it be? And incidentally, Two weeks before, about Christmas, he lost his mum and his best friend. And I said, could there be a possibility he was upset? <coughs> Feeling vulnerable? Recognize that you actually have to tell people how you feel before they die. And that's why he sent you that text. Should have seen her face. She's 73. So age. So my advice. On this one, I know you're not supposed to give advice when you're a coach, but I wish you the best. 
is gather facts and evidences. Because we create stories all the time. I do, even though I work on this stuff all the time, I still create stories. Ask yourself, is that true? Gather facts and evidences. And there's um, a few questions that you can use in order to do this. They come from Baron Katie. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's written a book called Lo Loving What Is, and she works it's a bit of CBT. Uh, but she's working with the, exactly this story. So the first question, when you're running a story, the point is, stop believing your story. That's the point. Question number one is, is that true? So I've changed it a little bit, but in a nutshell, is, is that true? Can you be absolutely sure that this is true? Do you have evidences and facts to support what you believe in that story? Question number two, how do you behave? How do you respond when you believe that story? What consequences on your behavior and your relationship does it have when you actually believe that story without knowing if it's true or not? Question number three, if you didn't believe that story, what would be different? How differently would you respond? How differently would you behave? What would be different? And the last one, I really like this one because it helps you reclaim your projections. Turn it around. So for example, the wife that goes, you didn't make dinner, therefore you don't love me. Turn it around by going, I didn't make you dinner. Does that mean I don't love you? So that helps two things, to break the complex equivalent, to recognize that A doesn't mean B, but also to start to identify your, the story you're creating, what's your projection in it, and start to become aware of your projections. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, <coughs> I'd like you to conclude with is just a few thoughts I'd like you to take with you. Uh, of course, I can't cover everything in such a short period of time. As I said, if you're interested, I'm running a workshop on all this where I will explain much more in depth the patterns, but also teach you tools on how to work on the codependency, but also communication tools, because it's quite important to learn how to communicate. It's a good thing to talk with your partner and help identify your projections and your shadows and everything, but you need to have the communi communication skills to do this, because it's quite challenging sometimes. So I'm teaching all this in a workshop in February, if you want some information, or if you want to book, there's papers on the table over there. But before I finish, I'd like, you to, I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. That the first thought is, we're not born with relationship skills. We're not even taught relationship skills. So if you want healthy relationships, if you want to experience deep, meaningful relationships, you need to learn about it. There's no two ways about it. You need to learn how to do this. And communication is very important for this. But it's not just about communication. It's also about taking responsibility. I too often see people coming to see me that they don't take responsibility. They blame it all on the other people. But that's never going to help because it's never one person's fault. There's always 50-50 or call it whatever you want. You have to share responsibility. So own it. Claim your responsibility in it. It doesn't mean you should blame yourself. It simply means recognize what's your part in it. And then share that. That would be much more constructive than the blaming game. Mm -hmm. Whenever you experience a strong emotions in a situation, whenever one of your buttons is pushed, ask yourself, what does it remind me of in my history? Who is that person that who do they remind me of? Or what is a similar situation I experienced in the past? And then start to discover your buttons. When you find yourself criticizing people, when you find yourself being very irritated by someone's behavior or trait, ask yourself, could there be a shadow there? Is there a part of me that I really don't like, that I reject, that I'm seeing in that person? So instead of 
attacking that person, criticizing that person, ask yourself, what is it in me that's mirrored? And start to learn to accept yourself. And then don't believe your story. That's my final word. Don't believe your story. Because what are the odds that you're spot on anyway? So question it. Thank you very much for listening.